And there are different versions of utilitarianism, different ways of presenting utilitarianism. But the way I presented it was as follows. We start with an account of each person's subjective good. And then we are required by utilitarianism to take an impartial attitude <coughs> toward each person's, toward each of those subjective goods. So this means finding some way of combining everybody's subjective good into one total maybe combining everybody's preferences into one complete system of preferences, and then use that system to rank possible outcomes of actions or institutions or whatever it is that we're evaluating, to rank them based on which will produce the most good, which will produce the best outcomes as measured by that total system of preferences. And I said that one very important uh, way of thinking about the structure of this theory is that it first identifies what is valuable or good, what makes one state of affairs good or outcome good or better than some other. And then, after it gives an account of what makes one state of affairs good or how to rank them in terms of their value or their goodness, and then it says that morality can be identified or morality can be defined as whatever is going to maximize that good, whatever is going to produce the best outcome where best is measured by this total satisfaction of preferences, or the total level of happiness, or the total level of utility. So the key here that I really want to emphasize, that you have to understand, the key here is that at this first stage, identifying what's good or what's valuable, the standard that we rank outcomes in terms of, at this first stage, we don't yet have moral principles for evaluation. That's the whole point of emphasizing first we identify what's good, and then morality is concerned with maximizing it. So the and then means we don't have moral principles until after we've identified what's good, and then the moral principles tell us what to do, namely maximize the production of what we already know is good, what we just learned at that first stage. So that's why I emphasize and then. Um, and the important point here is to see that at the first stage, when we're identifying what's good or what's valuable, there are no moral evaluations available because we don't yet have moral principles according to this theory. So the good that's identified at this first stage here is maybe pre-moral or amoral or non-moral. It's a good that has to be identified in a way that does not depend on making prior moral assessments. And this is what suggests, this structure of this theory is what suggests the objection that we discussed at the end, namely, how a utilitarian would um, try to handle maybe the desires that we intuitively might think of as immoral or wrong. Say, the desires that a sadist has, or the desires that a racist has, to inflict harm on other people. Okay, so don't get me wrong, I'm not saying that a utilitarian is a racist. What I am saying is we need to think about how a utilitarian would decide that racism is bad. Um, and the answer, of course, is that a, a utilitarian would calculate the levels of utility involved, the levels of satisfaction 
of everyone's preferences considered from an impartial point of view, crucially, without any prior evalu moral evaluation of those preferences. Okay, so if we're asking whether, from a utilitarian point of view, if we're asking whether um, allowing the sadist or the racist to beat other people up, um, we might say, well, the sadist or the racist will satisfy his preferences by doing that. That counts as a positive good, but of course the victim would lose utility, would be made very unhappy, or would not be able to satisfy his or her preferences very well at all in being beaten up. And we might think that that would be a greater loss than the gain to the person inflicting this um, beating. And we might also, for sophisticated utilitarians, think about the implications for innocent bystanders, maybe uh, fearful that they're going to get beat up, and maybe they're going to be made unhappy by that fear also. Okay, so plausibly we can think, think that the utilitarian would say this is not okay. That when we add together the levels of satisfaction of preferences of all the people involved, allowing the sadist or the racist to beat somebody up would have a net decrease on total happiness of the society. So it's not okay. Okay. But how bad is it? Well, I don't know. It depends on how strong the preferences are, and how many bystanders there are, and um, how unhappy they're made. It depends on the numbers, but let's assume it's pretty bad. Okay, now think about exactly the same scenario. <coughs> exactly the same scenario. Except now assume that the racist or the sadist would take a lot of pleasure, a lot more pleasure, in beating up his victim. He's really, really racist or really, really sadistic. Well, might turn out that still, overall, uh, allowing him to beat up his victims would um, decrease overall happiness. So decrease overall utility. Still not okay. But if in fact he takes more pleasure in this, it's going to be less bad when we weigh up the levels of happiness involved, if he gets more happiness than he did, well, overall, it would be higher than if he got less. And so from a utilitarian point of view, it still might not be okay, but it would be less bad if he gets more satisfaction. Um, um, and to me, this, I think, reveals a flaw in utilitarianism. Because it seems to me that the wrongness of his action, the wrongness, the immorality of the sadist or the racist beating up other people, has nothing at all to do with how much satisfaction or pleasure he would get in doing it. It's not mitigated by saying that he really wants to do that. So. Um, that, that seems irrelevant to the moral, to me, it seems irrelevant to the moral assessment of uh, the action. But utilitarianism says it, it's relevant. Utilitarianism says that the wrongness of his action would be mitigated, would be made less bad if he really wants to do it. Um, So one way of, so, sorry, so um, the force of this objection is to bring out, I think, the fact that utilitarianism has an account of what's good and what's valuable that does not depend on any prior moral assessment. So utilitarianism, because it has that structure that I started with describing, that it first identifies what's good without making moral assessments, 
and then says that what morality is about is promoting that pre-moral or non-moral or amoral good, it can't make prior judgments about which desires the satisfaction of which count and which don't. It, it can't say that the racist desires don't count because they're immoral, but the other ones do count. It can't say that because it doesn't have a moral theory available until after we identified what's good. Okay, so I think that this uh, argument, this objection, really, in my view, cuts to an essential feature of the structure of utilitarianism. So I want to give a name to the kind of theory that has the structure I just described. The kind of theory that says what morality is about is the definition of morality or the fundamental understanding of the structure of morality is to maximize some good, some value, that has to be understood in non-moral terms. Okay, so the name for that kind of theory is teleological. So a teleological moral theory, so a teleological moral theory says that morality maximizes some pre-moral good, some non-moral So it has these two steps that I talked about at the beginning. First, first that means before we have moral principles available to us, we identify what's good or valuable, and then we identify morality with promoting or maximizing that. Okay? So that's what a teleological moral theory is. In contrast, a deontological moral theory is one that's not teleological. That's it. So a deontological theory is one that's not teleological. A teleological theory has two parts. One, it identifies some pre-moral good. Two, it says that we are to maximize that. And so a deontological moral theory could deny either one or both of those two parts. A deontological theory could say that there's no pre-moral good. Or it could say that morality isn't concerned with maximizing a pre-moral good, or it could say that there's no pre-moral good and uh, morality is not concerned with maximizing anything. Okay, so this is very open-ended, right? I, I haven't given a positive characterization of the ontological theory except to say it rejects that structure. Okay, so Hobbes, for example, Hobbes' theory, has some features that sort of make it seem teleological, but it's not, because it denies that there is an objective good to be maximized. He thinks that there are many subjective goods. They're, they're all pre-moral in a sense. But there's not just one to be maximized. He thinks that maybe what morality is about is mm, compliance with your covenants, or maybe compliance with the commands of the state. On the other hand, obviously, utilitarianism in its various forms is a teleological theory. That's what I've been saying so far. Um, so there are, I said, different forms of utilitarianism. There are different, even more forms of teleological theories. And these are all going to differ one from another based on what they identify as good. They're going to differ, we're going to get different teleological theories, we're going to get different utilitarian theories based on differences over what